You're lying. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright, and welcome to my shop. Today we're talking about bow ties, or are they butterflies, or are they a Dutchman? Uh, they it's a, it's a thing that goes by many, many, many different names. Basically, it is a way to repair a crack or a wedge and keep it from splitting, or at least that's the idea behind it. We're going to dive in and look at a lot of that, uh, because there are a lot of myths and legends about these that... Uh, well, they're myths, so we're going to answer some of those as well. Uh, as well as I plan on going through making a whole one, we have a piece of zebra wood here, and then we're going to be putting it into this slab and fixing up this crack here. So it should be a fun night. Um, a couple of announcements of things coming up. Uh, I'm in the process of making paste wax. Uh, and this will be, I have two different paste wax here that I'm playing with. One of them is a hard wax. Um, this one is for rust prevention and uh, tool um, lubrication. And uh, oops, that one goes in here. And then I've got another one that is going to be a soft wax for wood finishing. And so I'm playing with ideas on actually getting these up. Um, and I might be offering a third one um, that's kind of in between the two, a food safe soft wax. Um, but we'll we'll see how that goes. So um, I'm currently playing around with them. I've had a whole bunch of people asking about them. Uh, but they'll be coming out probably in the next week and a half to two weeks or so. Um, I'll first be offering them to uh, patrons and members, so if you want to be first in the list, in there. And then second to the people on the Hive Mind on Facebook, as well as the people on my, uh, my email list. Um, I don't know how long this first batch is going to go because I'm going to kind of experiment with it, and then we'll see. And then uh, batches from then on I will I'll make as I can. Uh, but so if you're interested in that, uh, let me know. But uh, we'll be having some fun with those coming up. So stay tuned on that. Oh, oh you're yawning at that. I'm already <laughs> yawning. It's going to be a long <laughs> night. Yeah, Sarah didn't sleep much last night. So uh, life is fun. <laughs> Saturday in advance. <laughs> <laughs> so um, bow ties or Dutchmen or butterflies, uh, whatever you want to call them. Uh, these are um, basically wedges of wood and they're all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Most of the time they're shaped like a bow tie. Basically they're fatter on the ends than they are in the middle. And this way, when something is spreading on them, it can't spread out. It's sort of like a dovetail, a two-butted dovetail. Um, yeah. That's a, are you I, trying to make a dad I joke? I was trying to make a dad joke. <laughs> that just didn't come out right. Um, normally they're <laughs> shaped like this, but you'll see a lot with uh, router jigs that are shaped kind of like a dog bone. Um, because a router can do rounded corners, a router can't do these sharp corners. Uh, we'll be talking about that a little bit more. Uh, but one of the problems people have is the actual layout and uh, setup of that. And I actually have this, this is a pre-production um, jig, and uh, this is uh, from uh, a viewer of the channel actually sent this to me, and he's going to be selling these here soon. If you want to find out more about that, I have a link to his email down in the description below. Um, but this is kind of cool. It has all different angles from 10 degrees down to 32 degrees, different sizes and shapes. And so we're going to kind of be playing with this for the setup. But most of the time, um, you don't need one of these to do it. This just kind of makes it nice. And I actually haven't ever done it with this until a week or two ago. Um, and he sent this to me. It's like, oh, so I'm going to be using this tonight because it's a little bit different way of doing it. One of the nice things about it is it helps you visualize on the work you're working on. So first, let's look at the slab. This is a piece of box elder. Uh, box elder is a type of maple, and I've got to raise my camera up so you can actually get a better look at this. Um, it's a type of maple, but it is a type of soft maple, and it is a very, very soft maple. It is fantastic for hand tools. It's one of those woods that just really works well for hand tool woodworking because it is it's so soft and smooth. It has that creaminess of the maple, but much, much more soft, almost as soft as a poplar. Uh, this one also has this red flame coming through it. I don't know if it's picking up on the camera. Okay. If I put uh, BLO on that, that red flame just gets really bright red. Um, but down at this end, we have this crotch. Uh, so where the two limbs come off here and some crack. And I'm going to actually be squaring this off and turning this into a, a full board in the future. Um, but I want to stabilize this crack before I do anything else. Um, and so for this, uh, it doesn't actually go all the way through. On the other side, it's only about this big. I just can't lift it up. You know, It's only about uh, three or four inches. So I don't need a whole lot on this, but we're going to be putting one big bow tie right here. Um, that then brings me to the question of where do you need to use these? And most of the time, you don't need to use these, uh, especially if your furniture is going to be in air-conditioned world it's kind of superfluous. It's something that's not really needed. Um, if you're going to be doing something like an epoxy fill, a lot of times it's not needed. Like the, the two desks I have, I have cracks that are over six foot long going from three inches at one end to down to nothing. 
and I don't have any bow ties in them. The epoxy holds it together very nicely. Uh, but if this is going to be something that is in a lot of air movement, uh, it's not constantly air conditioned, then bow ties become very, very useful for that. Is that a super chat? It is a super chat. Oh, Andrew's, thank you, Andrew. Andrew's trying to give me coffee. <laughs> it will have to be swapped out for cocoa or tea. Sarah just doesn't like she the doesn't taste drink of coffee. coffee. For some reason. <laughs> but do you have we a mom need a joke? mom joke. We need, yes, I have. Do I have mom jokes? <laughs> Maybe tired, but I'm not negligent of my duties. What do you get when you mix alcohol and literature? Alcohol and literature. What? Tequila Mockingbird. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, you did a paper on that in your in undergrad, didn't you? Well, not the tequila part, but well, yeah. To kill a mockingbird, yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, yes. So, it's back to the butterfly. Night. <laughs> uh, what it will basically do is, especially if there's a crack, um, if you have any expansion and contraction of the wood, that crack will open and close and open and close. And slowly, it kind of works itself longer, larger. Um, and for most cracks, if they're small, you know, five, six inches or less, like this one, I'm probably not going to need to do that because it's in a crotch. The crack isn't going to go down farther. It's going to dead end into that crotch. Uh, so I don't need to worry about that as much. But I like the look of bow ties, and so I'm going to use it on this particular one because I want to kind of fit in and have a little bit more intrigue into this. Um, so I'm going to be putting a bow tie in here. If you're working with, you know, small cracks that are hairlined, just filling them with a with a CA glue or an epoxy is perfectly fine, and we'll do just we'll do exactly what you want. You'll see a lot of bow ties in Nakashima inspired furniture where you have a nice long crack, and you want to leave it open. You don't want to fill it with anything. Having the bow ties in there occasionally will uh, stabilize it and allow that crack to stop from uh, from propagating. Uh, then we can get into the size and shape of these. And this is where there are a lot of myths uh, because you have all sorts of different sizes on here. You can see, uh, actually, I don't know if you can see that. Let me do this. Oh, we can Focus, now. focus. There we go, that's better. Um, and so this one, you know, you know, two inches all the way up to the six inches and they go from really drastic angles. So in this one, I have a very thin waist here. Uh, it's a pretty sharp angle. This one doesn't have much angle at all. Um, but it's a really fat, stout waist. And you don't really need a lot of waist. You can have a tiny bit of waist, and this will, uh, you know, just having, what is that, about uh, quarter inch by quarter inch waist, that will hold a lot of crack. I mean, the, the tensile strength on a quarter inch piece of wood is, is incredible. Um, so a quarter inch waist is really all you need for almost all your cracks. Anything bigger than that is just there for aesthetics. Um, and then the other question is what angle? You don't need a drastic wide angle like this. Something that's more um, shallow and simple is all we really need for that. And I generally tend to like a, a shallow angle without a, without a lot of flare on it. And I like to have it with a thin waist. So kind of the combination of these two. So we're going to be playing with that on this tonight. So any questions before I jump into drawing things? Uh, let's see. Brian Fulmer asks, at what point is it too small for a bow tie and just fill with CA or epoxy? Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Usually it's around the <laughs> six inch or smaller size um, I'm just going to fill. Um, but again, it depends on the wood. If it is a natural crack that's splitting down the grain, I may want to bow tie it. If it's a crotch crack, probably not going to need a bow tie. <laughs> yeah. We got her to crack. I'm sorry, but between the, the chat and then what you just said, and being a nurse, it really just paints a picture. <laughs> if you ever watch uh, uh, Matt Cremona's channel, he's all about crotch. Um, <laughs> so we're actually making it out of zebra wood, and this is a this is a fun wood to work with, with a lot of light and dark grain. Uh, it makes the grain really pop out and so you can see it. And so in this case, we want to make sure we're careful with the grain because what you can do is you can have the grain parallel to one of the sides. You can see how this goes diagonal through there, but it's parallel to this side and parallel to this side. Whereas on this one, I have it, the grain going straight through. And most people tend to prefer the grain going straight through. It just looks a little bit better. Uh, but sometimes I've actually found that I like it being on a diagonal. Every now and then it just fits well into the, the piece that I'm working on. There really isn't a strength difference between the two. They're both relatively similar in strength. 
Um, and again, strength really isn't important when looking at a bow tie. You're not actually talking about a lot of strength in this. Um, the force cracking it open is an amazing, amazing amount of force. It's just a continuous, very, very small force. So you don't need to worry about the bow ties being strong. Um, you just need to worry about them fitting right. So um, I want something, I want to have a, a slightly larger bow tie, something about four inches, something that's sticking off about two inches on either side. And so I can go over here to this template. And on this one, I can come out here and I can find the four inch size dovetail. But the four inch size dovetail has a pretty tight waist. It's a, a fairly steep angle. On this one, it's a 28 degree. And I'd like to stick around something around a 12 degree. And the nice thing about this is I can actually set this up and use this, uh, except I have to grab my pen. Where did my pen go? There it is. So I can use this to draw out where I want this to be. Let me just make sure I'm on the right line here. That one. So I'm going to put it in here about two inches in, and I'm going to draw something on the 12 degree, and I'm going to put in a waist. Oop, I moved it. I'm going to put in a 12 degree waist here. We're being invaded. Kids are coming in. Kids are coming in. Buddy. And then I can extend these lines out. And this will just give me my 12 degree line on here. But then what I can do is I can figure out how thin do I want that waist to be. And I want it to be something around that wide. So I'm going to come in here and do this. And so I can lay those out and I have a very thin waist right here coming out to a longer line. I can extend that line out. And if I had the exact size and angle I wanted on here, then I could just use this pattern to draw that out. But this allows me to get a very even quick measurement from angle to angle. And then we can set this up, use it as a square. OK, um, so there's a question of why not a marking knife? Um, at this point, I don't need a marking knife, because whatever I cut this to is what I'm going to mark on the wood. Um, and so this is, this is a very important thing. It doesn't matter what you do on this. If you mark this up wrong, oh well. If you cut this wrong, oh well. Because whatever this ends up being, you transfer it onto this. And you can make that mortise match anything you make here. So it does not matter what you cut on this as long as you like this. And one of the things that I wanted to point out is I usually do um, odd shaped dovetails. I like to have one side bigger than the other, one side smaller. But in this case, I'm actually going to make them pretty symmetrical. Um, so I have them draw, draw, drawn, drawn. I have them drawn out that way to be the, the symmetrical fitting on here. So now we can go about cutting this out. Um, back up with this and show you on there. Any questions while I'm setting this up? Um. Okay, I've got one related to bow ties, and then I have two that are just general. What's so that? Dennis asked, should we cut a thick bow tie, then rip several thin ones? Can you say that again? Should we cut a thick bow tie, then rip several thin ones? I don't know what you're saying. So if you, if you make a big one and then rip it like you would a board, so they're all the same size. Oh. You could, if you wanted them all to be exactly the same, yeah. Um, usually what I want my bow tie to be is, I want my bow tie to be two, um, two thirds of the thickness of the board. You usually don't have the bow tie going all the way through, but I like it to be two thirds of the thickness of the board. So in this case, I'm gonna have a board that's gonna end up being around an inch and three quarters thick. Uh, so that means I'm gonna want it somewhere around uh, just, over, just over an inch, about an inch and a quarter. And I have my slab here actually at a, just over an inch. Uh, because I'm going to be planing this down and actually making this much thinner in the future, I'm actually going to recess this down into the work because I'm going to be planing down to it. Um, so this board is actually a little over an inch, inch thick. Uh, let me switch over to this. So first thing I want to do, let's see if I can move this far enough over here to show you. Hey, look at that. Look at the trash on my floor. First thing I want to do is cut this off. So we have the bow tie in here. Boom, boom. And I'm just going to cut it off to length of the bow tie. And for that, I'm going to grab cross cut panel saw. A little bit faster than my carcass saw. And I'm not caring too much. Just move that out of the way. Not caring too much about it being perfectly square yet.
That saw is dull. I need to sharpen that one. I love this end grain here. This just really comes out. Zebra wood is an incredibly beautiful wood. But yeah. So we've cut the board to length. Now we need to cut down on either side. And for that, I'm going to be using, let me see if I can get my carcass saw. Nope, my carcass saw is not deep enough. So I'm going to grab my tendon saw. And I am. Going across the grain, I'm mostly going with the grain, so it really doesn't matter if I use a cross cut or a uh, ripping saw. But uh, for this, we're going to use the uh, ripping saw, which is the um, tendon saw. And so I want to straighten this up so that my line is vertical. Just makes it easier to cut when the line is vertical. I can still cut at an angle if I need to, but it's always better if you can cut vertically. And I'm not being terribly careful about saying exactly on the line, because again, if I change anything on this, that's okay. Then I'm going to get really close to that, that corner there, but I'm not actually going to make it to that corner. I want to clean that corner out with a chisel, not with a saw. And then we're going to rotate it a bit and do it again. And then again. And then again. Any questions while I'm doing this? Um, Hugh the Maker asks, do bow ties need a wider waist for a piece under tension, such as a leg vice chop? Do, can you repeat that again? Do bow ties need a wider waist for a piece under tension, such as a leg vice chop? Um, I don't know why having a leg vise chop would make it under greater tension, um, but yes, if they are actually holding something together and the, the force is great upon them, then you might want to make a greater waist. But if you're really pulling something apart, you're not going to want to hold it together with a bow tie. A bow tie is really not a structural item. It's more a it just to hold things together a bit. fighting it because I'm going off the line more than I want, but again, it's okay. Let's actually lube this up. The saw is binding a bit. So we're going to use some paste wax. This is the hard paste wax that I will be selling. Just put it on one side, put it on the other. That runs a good bit smoother. Now let's flip it around and do the other two. getting close to the middle, but not actually getting to it. Staying a little ways away from it, we'll break it and then clean it up with a chisel. Because there's very few things as bad as seeing those saw marks cross in the middle. It just doesn't look right. One more. Uh oh, we got a kid. one down just a little more. There we go. Now we've gotten these pretty close, so hopefully they will just break like that. And nope, that one's going to take a little bit more convincing. Oh, I forget I have a microphone on. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys heard something I didn't. Uh, well, I was just Arthur, but I forgot to... Just like that. Now, we've got this ridge here in the middle. 
zoom in. Pilot dress. manipulation. We hear that phrase a lot in our house. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to use this to come in here and just clean these up. Get it tight too from one side and from the other. So while you're doing that, I have a question. Sure, what you got? Uh, Brian Fulmer asks, so would you say bow ties are more for wood expansion type stress rather than a joint? Yes. Um, they, they, they're, not a, they're not a very strong connection. They're not intended to add strength to the joint. They're intended to um, be there for looks, but then also um, just stop that slow pressure that comes on it. Now, the one thing I need to do here before I do anything else, I need to make sure all of these sides are perfectly square to the face. So I'm going to come in here with my square, and I'm going to check them. And I think they all need a little bit of work. Holy cow, that one needs a lot of work. And this one, this one's pretty good, but not perfect. Let me try from this side. Yeah, so on this one, you take off a little bit here, and you take a off a lot over here. So we're going to set this up in here again. And I'm going to start where I need to take off the most. Back it up. I'm going to use this as a plane to slowly chisel down. And it's very, very important that these edges all be square. Because later on, you're going to be referencing to it. If the, if the edge isn't flat, that's OK. But this edge has to be square to the bottom or top. And yes, I am chiseling towards myself. I would turn around and go the other way, but the camera's over there right now. So any questions while I'm doing this? Yeah, hang on. One just popped. I'm hanging. So, let's see. Porman asked, what happens if you put the grain on your bow tie in the same direction as the grain on the workpiece? Then the bow tie is perfectly worthless because the grain has no, there's no strength across the grain. Um, so if you have the grain going across the bow tie, then you have nothing holding the bow tie together at the waist. It may it's look all good. About the but waist, about the waist. <laughs> <laughs> may look good, but it's not useful. Let's see what we got here. Oh, square, 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 <laughs> square, 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 square. Check it from the other side as well. Good there. Now let's flip it over and do the other side. And on this one, ooh, pretty high over there. What do we got on this side? And this is one of the things you just got to take your time and do this right. Because if you don't do this step right, then your joint will not work. It will not be pretty. It will be very ugly. And we don't like ugly joints. Um, because if this isn't square, then you will draw your lines on the face that's touching, but the joining face will not be what's touching it is farther down into the wood. Go getting bed, Arthur. So almost there. And I know some people who will come in with a file at this time and clean them all up. Which I may actually do here. Some of these surfaces aren't perfectly smooth. That's good. That's good. And now I also have to do the ends. So this one should be good. Actually, it's off a little bit. Should be, but it's not. Of course, it's not. We're doing it live, so That's nothing works not. out with live. What, what uh, questions we got? Uh, Brian has asked, what kind of plane could someone who can't do that with a chisel and get it flat? Um, you can use a chisel plane, but you're basically going to be using a chisel at that point. Um, you, if you can't do that with a chisel, it's generally because your chisel isn't sharp. Uh, if it's taking too much force, then you're, you're pushing yourself around. Okay. I'll show you on this end. Actually, on this end, i got to cut it. Yeah, we got to cut that off. So, let me show you what we got here. Marking knife. Go 
going to cut that square and then I'm going to eyeball this it's right over here light to medium hard and then we're going to wrap it around over to this side and mark make our mark on this side that way we can cut straight down We can cut that off, put it into the vise, and come up here. Sorry, I was out of shot. I'm trying to figure out why you call it light, medium, and hard. Um, you push light on the first stroke with a knife, you push medium, and then you push hard. It just seems counter. Because if you push hard, if you push hard on the first stroke, it'll it tends to push the square off of your line. Okay, let's check that. Now if I had a shooting board, I could probably just set up the shooting board. Wow, I was way off on that one. So we're gonna actually clean this up with the big beefy low angle jack. <laughs> because I can. I'm gonna see where, oh yeah, I missed my line on this side. So I'm not going to plane off the edge. I'm just planing in towards the middle. And I could come in with a uh, uh, block plane, but I kind of like this. This is fun. There you go. Let me check that again, and the rest I can just clean up with a chisel. Yeah, I got to do a little more chisel work. The real reason I didn't use the block plane is my block plane is a bit dull at the moment. My chisel is nice and sharp. Here, zoom in a little bit. Let you see that. What questions we got? All right, I think we've got caught up on the bow tie ones. Let's see. Um, Dennis Miko asks, "Do you subscribe to Woodworking Magazine, and which one?" What do you like um, about them? No, I do not subscribe to any of the woodworking magazines. The um, reason being is, I mean, there's a lot of great information in there, but I would rather look for the information I want than every month be given a selection of information. And uh, it just, it's not worth my time I, I used to subscribe to them, and I have probably two years worth of magazines that I've never actually read, just because I, I don't find the time going into it to be, it's not that it's worth my time, it's just that my time is very, very valuable, and I would rather spend the same amount of time looking for things in other sources where I can find it faster because I can find exactly what I'm looking for. Um, so no, I don't. But that doesn't mean that they're bad, that just means that they're not right for me. Um, just because I read incredibly slowly. Um, and so the written word is very, very inefficient for me. So that's why I don't. But nothing against them. I, I, I love them. And when I do have the time, I do go back and occasionally read some of the old ones. But that's very rare that I have the time to sit down and read. So. If they but made an audio book yeah, magazine if, of what Well, I mean, like the um, <laughs> um, Popular Woodworking has um, a, uh, um, what's I'm looking for? Podcast? Podcast, there we are. And I listen to that. That's great. So now we want to get this bow tie and put it into this. And now we have reality, we want to mark onto this. And this is where people tend to have problems because this is the important thing. If I can get a really nice clean mark, from my bow tie onto the board, then I can get a really nice clean fit. And the easiest way to do that is actually with double-sided tape. Now, I know some people who use masking tape and some CA glue, but I really like using just a cheap masking tape, uh, uh, um, carpet tape. It doesn't hold really well, um, but it holds well enough. So we can put this on there, work it down in. 
Come on, get off there. Okay, are you trying to be on the other camera? Am I? Oh, sorry. Switch over to this one. Here we go. And take that off. Here we go. Now I can put this on here. And I can line it up exactly where I want it. Set it down. And work it down in. And because my board isn't perfectly straight, I have to be careful I don't push over here. But if, as long as I push in the middle here, we're good. And now I can bring in my marking knife. I can hold it here. And I want to keep my marking knife with the reference face flat up against the work. That way I get a perfectly straight line down. If I tip the knife at all, then I'll be working underneath it and getting a line that's too small. Or if I tip it the other way, I get a line that's too big. Light, medium, hard. Light, medium, hard. Again, if I push too hard at the beginning, then I could move the bow tie and get an inaccurate mark. Light, medium, hard. And then starting from the middle, light, medium, hard. One more. Light, medium. So Brian says, Sarah, can I ask what that means? How light? Um, light is just enough to mark the wood. Then I'm going to come back hard. I'm going to put a bit of pressure into it and dig down in. And then hard is I'm going to actually put my weight into it and cut the wood. Um, because a hard line you can see. A medium line you might be able to pick out, but a soft line is usually hard to see. But getting that initial scratch in the wood allows the knife then to follow that scratch again. So now I can peel this up, peel off all this masking. And now I have this gorgeously smooth line, which you're probably not going to be able to see, but I'll outline it here so that you guys can see it. I generally do not outline the marks that I make because they have a tendency to actually make the, li the line harder to see. see ha make the exact line harder to see. They may show me where the line is, but I don't generally have a problem with where the line is. It just makes a thickness to it that's harder to actually identify. So I've got this. I want to dig down this. Uh, most of the time I want to dig this down all but like a sixteenth of an inch. So I want like a sixteenth of an inch of this sticking up above the wood. In this case, I actually want this to sink down into the wood because later I'm going to be coming back and flattening this and I'm going to be taking off eh, around an eighth inch or so. So I want this to be down What are you using inch that so. for anyways? What's that? Like what project is that going to be for? I don't know yet. Okay, I th that's what I was wondering. Oh, and here's another thing to keep in mind. Um, always know where this goes so it's not flipped like this later on you're trying to shove it in this way you're like it's not fitting why is it not fitting um, because it doesn't matter how accurately you cut this out this end will never be the exact same as this end and this side will never be the exact same as this side so in this case i'm going to come over here and i'm going to go one and two and i'm going to come over here and two and one and that way i know this block matches one and two I would have done like smiley face heart. <laughs> yeah, some people will come through here and they'll do like line through, line through, line through, line through, kind of creating a V. Um, and that oh, way mine's can, just see much happier. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I find one, two, one, two makes it far more obvious because if it's upside down, I don't see any numbering, any lettering on there. If it's right side up, you know the two goes with the two and the one goes with the one. It's pretty obvious. Um, so, any questions while I set up the next step? Let's see. Harold Schultz asks, I've heard that if you put the ties in sand and heat the sand, it shrinks the tie and makes it easier to insert, and then the glue expands it back. Ever tried it? Uh, yes. Uh, you can do that even without sand. You can just do it, you know, stick it in the microwave for a few seconds, and uh, that will cure it up pretty quickly. Um, I don't do that because if, if the mortise is cut to the right size, then it's cut to the right size. There isn't a way to mark the mortise smaller than the piece, um, and so it's kind of a thing. I don't want I don't want this to be exerting force on the wood. So if I shrink this and I shove it down into the hole, and then it expands, then I've just put more tension into the wood, trying to spread the crack that I just made. And I just put it in to stop, and so I I don't like doing that very much. Um, 
<laughs> oh yeah, this will surprise a few people. I'm using a, uh, um, I want to call it eagle owl. Um, what's the word? Wood owl. There's the word. Um, this is a, it's a, a three prong auger bit. I'll show you this. Um, they've been around for a while, but I haven't. Well, one of the problems with them is they all have a hex shank, and it's hard for a lot of the braces to get a good grip on that. Um, but this is a new thing that's going to be coming out here soon from Tay Tools um, that is designed for these specifically. And it actually holds perfectly so I can fit that shank in here and now run it with my, uh, my brace and bit. Uh, so you'll see those probably coming out of Tay Tools here soon. I've seen a few others, but I haven't seen them with the right size for this. So I'm actually going to come in. Whoa! Before I do that, I got into talking, and I need to mark it first. I want to know how far down to take it. And so I'm going to grab some masking tape, and I'm going to put it on the bit at the right depth down. So I can come in here and accept my auger on here, and I want it to come in that far. So I can set my masking tape on there. And I'm going to create a flag. Some people like to just wrap it around rather than creating a flag. I like to create a flag. But this way, once that flag starts rubbing, I know that I'm down to the depth of this. In that case, I'm just going to go one or two cranks further to make sure I'm down at the right depth. Oh, these wood owl bits are just so sharp. I bet they're a real ho hoot. Ooh, yes, they are. <laughs> if I could talk. The downside to them is that they are almost impossible to sharpen. Um, so once they go dull, they go dull. Um, you, you can do some sharpening to them, but not much. So if you ever hit a screw or something with it, eh. But they just, they cut like hot cheese through butter. Cheese? <laughs> what in the world? I think there were a few holes in that plan. <laughs> How so, is this a bad plan? This is why Sarah's shirt, because you know, we got the dad joke shirt. The next shirt is mom jokes, greater yes. than dad jokes, and tonight has proven it. Mom jokes are vastly superior to dad jokes. <laughs> they are. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to take out the vast majority of the waste with this because I can. Uh, it also makes it much, much easier for chiseling. Um, and what I want to do is I want to try and break all the fibers of the wood coming through this. So usually the fibers are going across the dovetail. So I want to have a string going all the way down the length of the dovetail of all of these cuts. That way I sever every fiber going through it. Um, in other words, normally, focus on this. Normally, the wood grain is going across the dovetail, so I want to have a whole string of holes going across, severing all these fibers going through. It just makes it easier to chisel when those fibers be severed. It's not just about removing waste, it's about cutting the fibers so that you can chisel them out easier. Any questions on doing this? Um. Mm -hmm. Dennis Miko, I want to know what is the size of the brace? Um, this is a 12-inch uh, throw brace, I think. Yeah, yeah, 12-inch. Um, and the size of a brace is the distance of the arm out. So in this case, it's 6 inches out, so it has 12 inches of throw. This one is three inches out, so it has six inches of throw. And the larger the brace, the more torque you have on it. And surprisingly, this drill, this brace, has more torque than the biggest battery-powered drill you have, because your biggest battery-powered drill, the torque is determined by how far your hand is away from the uh, the spin, and so you can only have as much torque as your hand can can force, and because in this your hand is farther away from the center, you can actually get more torque on it. Oops. 
Flip that. It helps if I tighten that down a bit. There we go. So. Are you ready for another question? Sure. All right. Let's see. Kenny and Janet Horn asked, would the, will the wood by right wax come in a commemorative tin suitable for holiday giving? Um, it will come in the gold tins you see here. So, wood by right logo tin. I've got... The first batch, I'm going to make 100 total, so 50 of each type. Um, or 30, 30, 30. I haven't decided if I'm going to make three different types or just two. But I don't know if I would call it com commemorative. <laughs> Limited edition? Limited edition, yes. Next ones may come in silver. So you only get the gold if you're in the first run. That might be a way to do it. Well, then it could become... Commemorative Christmassy because then it would be silver and gold. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so now here I have the question of do I go down to a smaller bit? Um, because let me sh move over to this. You can see here I haven't done anything right here in the middle. And I think I want to move over to the 3 8 because that will fit right there in the middle. Yeah, let's do the 3 8 and do two more holes. That way so. I can make sure I get all the way through it because it's hard to cut out everything here in the middle with just a chisel. You can, but it will save you a lot of time to do it this way. What do we got? Uh, let's see. Putting another flag Two in this one. Two questions, Stacey. Porman asked, have you decided on the price on a price for the wax? Um, I have not yet. The hard wax will be a little bit cheaper, so I'm thinking it will be around $16, and the soft wax will be around $18 because um, there's more that goes into the soft wax because uh, it will be a um, I have uh, mineral spirits in there to thin it out um, but no I haven't come up with an actual price I'm, I'm trying to get my recipe down and the method of actually doing the work and once all that's done then I will know how much the actual process costs because I try to sell things at a price where I will make some money, but I want it to be as affordable as humanly possible. Though with a lot of things hand tool wise, that's not always possible. Uh, let's so now I'm kind of going in it from an angle that, because this middle section is. Okay, are you trying to be in difficult. the far out camera? Do you yeah, I want to be in the far out okay. camera so you can see the angle. Because they like being yeah. up in the edge. So let me move back to this. So now, hmm, fill the beard. Hmm, that's good. So now we need to come in and remove all this. And that chisel I just had is right here. So I'm going to grab a larger three inch chisel. And the mallet I want to use is on the floor, of course. Grabbing my joiner's mallet. Back up a little bit here. And I'm going to stay away from the line, about a sixteenth inch or so. Chop down a little ways. I don't want to really pound this down because I don't want to pop anything out. You can see this board is not flat, so it's bouncing all over the place. I'll zoom in a bit more so you can see this. This is where things get loud. I'm just going to go all the way around about a sixteenth inch or so away from the line. And into the corners, still away from the line. Just going to go in a little ways. Want to make sure I don't split out any wood, because when you start getting close, it's easy for the the split of the chisel to run out into the work where you don't want it. Yeah, inside corners are an interesting thing because there is no power tool that will give you a clean inside corner. You can get really, really close, but you won't get a clean inside corner. You can get a mortising hollow auger, a hollow square auger, but it's still at the bottom doesn't look great. You can come in with a, a vibrating tool, but still it's not looking as good as a chisel. And so a chisel is one of those things, if you want these to be square, 
you're going to have to have a chisel. Almost there. Walk it in, stay away, about 16th inch or so. And here I didn't drill out as much, so I'm having a little bit harder time. So in this case, I'm going to grab a 3 8 inch chisel. I'm going to come in at an angle, just pry up this excess in the middle, just clear out that space. Makes it easier to bring in the bigger chisel. Set that down and keep on going. And I want to clean this all the way out down to full depth, staying about a sixteenth inch away. You know, they have an advantage when you do that. What, they can turn the sound they down? They can turn the volume down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's come in here and pry out. Just make sure I'm at this. Got bark in here. Woof. Oh, come on, that was pretty good. Well, it just verifies you should be in a doghouse now. <laughs> home sweet home. Yeah. There's a good shirt. Picture of a doghouse, home sweet home. Wood by right on the corner. <laughs> oh, they say you're making it look easy on purpose. <laughs> I'd offer to do it, but I'm afraid I'd screw it up. <laughs> now I gotta oh. get a little more vicious about it to get down to full depth. Especially with this board not being flat. I was thinking about flattening it ahead of time before doing the, uh, the dovetail work, but then ran out of time. And I want, didn't want to do it on just a simple scrap, so I wanted to actually bring this one out. So that means it's going to bounce around a bit more, but oh well. Hard for me, but... Oh, Brian says that he thought there aren't any mistakes. They're features, so Sayer should try. <laughs> yeah, you can come over here in a minute. Let me get this down. Once I get this layer down, happy little then you features. can do the trim around it. <laughs> What's that? He said, happy little features. Yes. <laughs> Okay, now let's blow this out. Don't blow it. The beard likes to fill up. But that sounds good on the microphone. <laughs> okay, getting close to it. Now, I'm going to go all the way around and make sure I'm down to full depth on all of these edges. It's very, very important before doing the actual edge that you be at full depth all the way around at that 16th of an inch in from, in from the line. This way, when you actually chisel down, the wood isn't forcing the chisel back into the work. It's keeping it where it needs to be. I think I'm pretty close. Now some people like to bring in the uh, router plane at this point because you want to get it down to complete perfect depth. I like to actually wait on that until after I've trimmed out most everything. But I don't know, in this case, I might want to actually bring it in. Going in here, bevel down on the chisel allows me to get into these angles. And getting a chisel that is the same width as the waist here makes it easy so you can come in from either angle. So, is this a waist not want not situation? Pretty much. Okay. They want to know Any how questions? thick Sorry. the wood is. Uh, this slab is, well, right now rough thickness is about two inches. Um, but once I actually get it planed down, it will be uh, around an inch and a half because it is very, very warped. Here, back that up and then bit. how thick is our bow tie? 
Um, the bow tie is a little over one inch thick, and I'm going to recess it down in there uh, farther down than it is thick, uh, and that will give me, um, when I plane this down, I'll get down to it. So this will, normally the bow tie will be sticking up above the work surface when it's all done. I actually want it to be below the work surface on this one. So we've cleaned it all down to there, and I think, let me grab my router plane here. Any questions on setting this up? Um. Let's see. Yeah, hang on. That one, no. Where'd my other foot go? Where's my foot? There it is. I, they want to know, is that a Cremona slab? Um, no, actually, this one was given to me by one of the fans on the channel. Um, I got it last year, yeah, a little over okay, a year hey. ago, at our uh, garage sale. <laughs> yes, Tommy, it's always 8 Central time on two. well, almost always on Tuesdays, 8 Central. Yep. What, what, wait. What's that? You said I was going to get to play. Yes, you are. Okay. Yeah, I, I have not gotten to it. I'm going to actually go ahead and I'm gonna play with the router being at the right depth first. Let's see if my router can go that deep. I forgot to check that first. Because what is right. my max depth? Are you ready for a couple of questions while you do yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the question? Oh, uh, let's see. Um, Scott nope, my router cannot go deep enough. Asks, my bits are constantly falling out of my brace. Am I doing something wrong or is it my brace? Um, probably the brace, um, because what happens is they have a, a square taper. The brace needs to actually go all the way around that square taper and bite on the far side so that the square taper can't pull out. Um, so if they're falling out, it means that the jaw isn't getting all the way around it. No, I can't do that, so I'm going to go down to my quarter inch here, and this will allow me to go bevel down to the bottom and just clean out anything that's sticking up high. So normally I would use the router plane, but my router plane won't go deep enough to get this. So in this case, quarter inch chisel gets all the way down there, all the way along. Oh, he's worn a person. Sorry, chiseling again. Good information, late. Usually we yell noise at each other when we're about to do something loudly. <laughs> Fine, noise. You better? just did that extra hard on purpose. I don't know what you're talking about. I wouldn't do that to you. <laughs> liar, liar, pants on fire. Any questions? Yeah, Sarah's turn. Question oh, yeah. mark. Let me get this in here. See, the problem is he doesn't want to give it up. <laughs> well, it can't be any worse than the dovetail I made on sa Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> Should we my talk about that? My slaughter tails. Your slaughter tails, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You were worried about me messing them up. <laughs> he got called out on that by somebody. Okay. So, uh, if you want to come over here. I'm coming. Keep them down to depth all the way around here. Just ignore the fact I don't have shoes on only socks. Do I need my stool? Uh, yes. Bring the stool sample. <laughs> <laughs> so, now I'm going to grab a half inch chisel. Uh, because when I'm doing the final work of getting up close to the line, I want something smaller. Something smaller gives you a little bit more accuracy. And I'm going to get it really, really close to the line. And then once I get it right up close to the line, then I'm going to get the bigger one, which will give me a smoother shot. So I'm going to show you what all I'm doing here after I move this. I thought I was probably lying about being in my jammy pants. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm about a 16th inch or so away from the line. Yes. And if you slide it back, you can actually feel when it catches in that line. So okay. it's, it's deceptive because I drew that pin in there so people can see it. As you can see back here, that's the actual thickness of the line. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually going to go about halfway between the two. And I'm going to eyeball it the chisel as vertical. And I'm going to run it all the way down. Put about halfway between the two. Eyeball it's vertical. And run it all the way down. See how that works? So here, I'll let you do one of these two sides. 
So usually you want to pinch the chisel like a pin or pencil like this. And then that allows you to eyeball it, and then you can come in. We're not looking for hitting it, we're just looking for tapping. See that works? Here. It's very close to my face. I'm very, very careful of your face. It is one of the most precious things to me. Oh, look at you, trainer. Sick only to your backside. Oh, that was on camera. Keep it G. <laughs> All right, yeah. well, yeah, I realized they turned it. Okay, wait, 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 wait. You told me to hold it down here. Yep. See, I gotta pretend I'm listening. Am I good? Yep. Just hit it. All right, now wait, wait. You know, one of the things that's gonna happen is as you go in, the chisel is naturally gonna want to start turning in because the bevel is on that side there. So you have to kind of work it, and so sometimes it means pulling it back this way a little ways, but you don't want to actually pull it. When it's in there, you want to pull it when you hit it. Otherwise, if you pull it when you're in there, you're just going to be bending the chisel. But if you pull it when you hit it, it actually will steer the chisel. So it's one of those, those tiny little things you learn over time that you won't get right now, but that's the goal of it, is to steer it when you hit it, not when it's locked in place. I notice you're being very careful with your words while I'm holding them down. <laughs> <laughs> so don't pull ahead of time, just pull as. Yep. And that is okay if I'm holding it up here now that it's yeah. in there. Right. Um, I need a grow nest. That's still good. There, you're down to depth. Okay. And so the reason for holding it here is if I'm holding it here, it's very, very easy to set it. Let me switch back over to this one. It's very, very easy to set it exactly where I want. I get more control over it here. And then. Like sometimes I'll switch up to this, and it's very quick to ju okay. adjust back to so this. So I have a question. For someone my size, they would... probably hold it like this. Okay. Or so I didn't know it. if using a smaller, I mean, I know a smaller chisel would take more time. I guess it is a pretty small chisel. Yeah, it looks really big. Yeah, they all have the same size handle. So. I know, but I meant to hold it here. You have to remember baby hands. <laughs> baby hands. She said it, not me. Oh, we're not, we're not <laughs> saying anything that's not truth right now. <laughs> when you stop growing at age 11, 12, I mean, come on. Stop moving. Am I good? Yep. Am I still good? Yep. All right, now what you're running into here is you're into the corner. Yes. And so the, the tip that's in the corner doesn't want to move as easily as the tip that's out of the corner. And so the chisel will start to move like that. <gasps> I was trying to make it not tilt the other and way. And so usually what I do in the corner is you go down about a quarter inch, and then you rotate and you come over onto this side. You take this one down about a quarter inch. I love how you didn't tell me that ahead of time. Well, that's what I'm showing you in live. <laughs> And then you come back to this side and do this one down a quarter inch. And then you come back to this side and do it down a quarter inch. So like that. And then you can come back and do this one. So you can do that. Tap it down. Hit it. Hit it, hit it. Hit it, hit it. Okay. Now we can switch back over to this side here. Hit it. That one you're going with the grain, so it slides out a lot easier. I was going to say, it was definitely a difference. Let's come back to this one, though. You got it? Yep. I can't even see if I'm hitting it straight. I'm just hitting yep. it at this point. Yeah, you can hit that one down. <laughs> cool. We'll call it good. We'll be here all night if I'm going to finish that. <laughs> I'm gonna run this. Puppy dog. So I'm going to be staying about half the distance away, so like around a 30 second or so. Actually, on this side, because I'm going with the grain. Oh, I left my stool over there. Uh. Here, I'll bring it. And the movie's over. Here we go. Cool. Let me take this back over to her. She's the one I love. What? Oh, thank you. I was reading. <laughs> Mm. So, 
Any questions while I'm running around this? Uh, uh, I don't know. Okay, I haven't caught up in the chat there. Let's see. And uh, what did he ask? How do you decide where to place the bow tie along the crack, i.e., how close to the edge if the crack runs all the way out? Um, it all depends on the crack, the structure, and it's one of those things you just kind of eyeball and look, do what is aesthetically pleasing to you. Um, yeah, there really is no rule of thumb as to where to put them. It's one of those things you just do. Go and look at a bunch of uh, um, Krenoff designs. Not, not Krenoff. Um, oh, what's his name? What are we talking about? And uh, just look at others and what they've done, and you'll find other pictures of cracks that are similar to yours, and you can kind of mimic their spacing. Oops, that one went in deep. Okay, now I can do this end. This one's a little more cross grained. So, almost done with this one, and now we're going to go back through and put it straight into that marking gauge line. Just so you know, we has a super chat. Ah, is it a question or just a. It, James Frank fun for you? says, Great seeing the two of you working together. I love working with my wife in the shop. It's far more enjoyable than just me and my tools. I mean, me and my tools is fun, but it's far more fun with my wife. It is fun. Because, you know, at least it's a hobby that I get something out of rather than <laughs> running ultra get a piece of furniture or half marathons. Apparently, I'm going getting my scuba diving certificate this weekend because my bucket list turns into whatever James decides is his hobby for the week. So Just, wait until, just wait until the skydiving comes out. You know, actually, I'd be okay with that. But I went on to tandem skydiving. All right, we got, we got, wait, we gotta get a mom joke. So I'm just cleaning out all these chips. All right, all right, I got one. Okay, what you got? What's the definition of a will? What? Come on, it's a dead giveaway. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, right, let's make some wood chips here. <laughs> We're at 9.03, just so you know. What's that? We're at 9.03, just so you know. Oh, really? Oh, my. My time's yeah. gone out. Okay, so let me speed this up. Sorry, I spent too much time with that. I'm going to put this right into that marking gauge line now that I'm close enough to it. Switch back over to this camera. And now that I'm right in that marking gauge line, I'm going to eyeball it's vertical. I'm going to run right down. I'm going to do this all the way around. I'm using my bigger chisel this time because I have very little to get rid of. And when it gets to the corners, those are the hard parts. So I'm going to stay out from the corner just a little bit. That way I can come back in and clean up the corner and just work on the corner at any given time. Come back and hit that corner. Or I could just wrap it up and you guys don't get to see the dovetail going. Well, that's the best part. I know. <laughs> Any questions? Well, we might just have to make it bow ties chapter two next week. Right, let's see. Yes, Harold Golden asks, is there a rule of thumb to tell us how many bow ties you install per unit of crack? Nope. Just look at what others have done. Learn from what you see. And find some other piece of furniture that someone has done who you trust. It's about a similar amount of crack size. It's one of those things you just eyeball eventually and you... So are you really telling people they need to compare their cracks? Yep. <laughs> My crack is bigger than your crack. <laughs> is 
Spencer really needs to go to bed. <laughs> you heard it here, folks. <laughs> well, my job is to crack people up. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> that feels like a bad Google search waiting to happen. <laughs> <sighs> yes, it took that long to get to that joke. <laughs> Almost there. This is where I start running into problems. I want to speed things up as I get close, but I can't speed them up. Keep it, keep I it feel straight, like we're like medical. a cross between like that dry bar comedy thing you see on Facebook and woodworking. Like <laughs> we're the perfect marriage of such things. Okay. Now let's pull out all these chips. Pull out all the stops. And get this thing down in here. So theoretically, it should cut right in from here point from here on. Because we went right into our marking gauge line, we went no farther. We're not adjusting anything, and usually that's the, the place where people run into problems. Is they try fitting it and then they adjust it, and they try fitting it and then they adjust it, and the more you adjust it, the more problems you run into. Ah. <laughs> Wood chips. They don't taste as good as they sound. Almost there. So now I'm going to look at the bottom corner, make sure it's flat all the way around. Do any last little bit of detail. Just using my small quarter inch to get down into the corners. Anything that hasn't been hit. Yes, I'm chiseling towards myself because I'm getting uptight with the time. Don't chisel towards yourself. It's a stupid thing to do. As every parent has said to their child, <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. And we're almost there. Okay, now let's actually see just how close this gets. I want to make sure I've got one to two, two to one, and I this one. Let's make sure to this one. So I fit this on here, and I'm just gonna hit it with my fist and make sure that it slides in there. And I'm good and tight all the way around, and I am good and tight. So let's grab this and uh oh uh -oh. I need to glue it before I do that because this is ready to go in I made sure that these are vertical eyeballing them got my that ready and I never test fit it because if you test fit it you're not going to be able to get it out a good Dutchman is something that you only get to try when you actually do it. And as long as I can push it in and make sure that the initial edge is clean, and I, I know that all my edges are square, when this slides in, my final edge will be nice and clean as well. Make sure I put a lot of glue on the sides. He has a lot of oops. <laughs> And then a good pile on the bottom. So poor man wants to know how much would you sell your wooden low angle jointer slash smoother for? Um, I don't generally sell what I make. <laughs> so here, let me switch over to this one. Let's drive this sucker down. Uh, 
And as at this moment I realized I forgot I didn't cut it down a little bit far this time. I only cut it down to the minimum height, so it's going to be sticking out a little bit. So I'm not going to get it down quite as far as I originally wanted. I need some blocks of wood. I can push it down a little farther with it. Yep. Stink, that's as far as that one's going. Oh, there it is. So this is actually what you normally want it to be sticking up above. But because when we're flattening the slab, I'm going to end up taking off a little more than an eighth inch on this. And now we can come in here and check the edges. And that is pretty darn tight. It's a slight bit of gapping here, but I think that that's just bruising of the wood. And we got a little bit of gap over here where the chisel went a bit wide. Let me take this off and show you. And take this off the tripod. Whoa. Ooh, Whoa. things are going to get funky here. So I do it handheld. But this will allow me to get in here. So this is the bad side. Let me see if I can actually focus there. And it's ever so slightly off. Three or four sheets of paper right there. Um, but that's probably just bruising. This side perfectly tight. This side perfectly tight. <laughs> this side really nice and tight. That side Brian really nice says and tight. the gaps aren't in Sarah's work, just making the connection. No, no, hers <laughs> works good. That's probably the, the worst gap right there where the chisel went a bit off the line. Um, but the rest of it I'm really happy with. So, yeah. There we go. That is a dovetail. Um, a dovetail. A, dovetail. <laughs> a double dovetail. <laughs> a push me, pull you dove. Um, so it's one of those things that you, as long as you transfer the line right and you cut away from the line as long as you possibly can until you can just shear that line off, it'll fit right in. And I, I really never had a huge issue with that once I understood that as long as the, 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 the bow tie is square and I know that last shaving went right into the marking gauge line and I know it was nice and true and square, then the two of them go together. Um, it's, it's getting that, that reference of making the lines perfect and making that final shear of the chisel perfect, that, that's where all of the challenge generally comes from. So, any last minute questions? No, I just realized my question thing disappeared. Did it? Um, if there was a question, oh, there they are. Let's see. Um, Let's two do more. Like two more, yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Brian asks. As these are both unrelated to bow ties. Do you keep a general purpose thwacker hammer around, or just use mallets? Um, like a claw hammer, I sometimes have one in the shop, but I rarely ever use it for shop. Um, I have a ball peen hammer that I occasionally pull out, um, but I don't have. Other than my plane adjustment hammer, I don't have any other metal hammers. Um, I generally use the, uh, the joiner's mallet for most everything. Um, or my, my finishing mallet, which is a slightly softer um, wood that doesn't dent as easily. What's the next one? Excuse me. Uh, so as Mercy asked, what's the best way to straighten a bent curved rip handsaw, or can it be done? I bought one really cheap and afterwards noticed it was curved a little. Yes, if it has a curve, that's not too much of a problem. You grab a uh, few. Nope, you're too thick. I'm trying to get one that will demonstrate these easily. So let's, let's actually put a curve into this one. And so, yes, I'm going to bend the toe all the way around to the heel. Oh! I'm going to jam okay. my thumb. Jeez. And hey, we got a bit of a curve in this one. Um, here. <laughs> You, you really got to force these because they're made of spring steel. Uh, let me move to something around here. So, let me see if I can get this curve out here. Actually, it didn't get much of a curve. Let's try it again. Just be a little bit more forceful with it this time. There we go. Now we got a curve. So, let me see if I can show this. You can see it curving a little bit that way. And the way you can fix it is you bend it the opposite direction. And you really got to bend them because the spring steel is very resilient. And it was actually a little bit too much. And back to there. That was a little too much. Not too much. <laughs> They're all and just go back and forth, back and forth until you get it nice and straight. And there. Now we're back to perfectly straight and true. 
And so it's literally just bending it back. If you just have a bend in the blade plate, just bend it. And that's all it takes. If there's a kink though, if there's a, a point which turns very, very sharply, then you're gonna have problems. Those are, are incredibly difficult to take off and take a serious amount of skill and time. Um, but for just a bend, bend it back the other way and you're good to go. So hope that answers the question. So what did you do? I didn't even know what you did. Oh, I was bending it all the way over, got toe to heel, and it suddenly slipped on my hand and went flap. <laughs> my hand was in the way, I jammed my thumb. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, I think that about it. Um, took a little longer than I expected for this one because we were doing a lot more talking and demonstrating. Usually for this one, I would allot myself around 25 minutes. And uh, for Just cutting the boat down, fitting it all in. They want to make sure you're okay. <laughs> yeah, fine. Um, yeah, uh, so if you are interested in the, uh, the paste wax, uh, I will be announcing that to patrons and members first. Um, and once they've had their fill of it, then I'll announce it to the people on the Facebook HiveMind group, uh, as well as those on my list. Um, and then after they've had enough and I've gotten enough back in stock, then I'm going to do a video showing how I make it and what all goes into it. Um, so if you want that, um, stay tuned. It'll be coming out here very soon. So I think that'll about do it. Anything I'm forgetting? No, because I'm afraid you're going to hurt yourself if we can. I never hurt myself. What are you talking about? <laughs> I've only fallen off of two roofs. <laughs> so I think that'll do it. And until next time, have a wonderful day. <laughs> I'm hanging. Goodbye.